Hi, everybody. I guess at some stage, most of you've had an, an X-ray. I'd ask you to put your hands up if you've had, but I'm going to assume at this stage that you probably all have had an X-ray at some point. If you haven't, then you haven't been to the dentist, for example, lately. Um, a probably a bit more of an advanced question would be to ask you if you actually had a CT. And a CT is a bit more expensive, I guess, so you tend not to get them in the hospitals unless you really require them. But a CT is, again, a bit like an X-ray, but slightly more advanced. The thing that they both have in common is they use radiation as a way of imaging patients, typically. And the thing about the radiation is actually it's ionising radiation. So if you think radiation, oh, taboo, you know, you're not going to... Radiation is, is, is bad, right? Well, in actual fact, it probably is. And if you go and do medical physics as a, as, a, as a course, you'll find out that the risk of developing complications, for example, cancers, depend on how much radiation you're ionising radiation you're exposed to. A little bit of a, I guess a bit of an irony there is that if you do end up getting cancer, then one of the ways of actually treating cancer is, again, using ionising radiation. There, there are other alternatives, but from the medical physicist's perspective, what we tend to concentrate on is the interaction of <coughs> um, ionising radiation with tissue. <coughs> and so there's sort of the two sides, there's the, uh, the imaging side and the uh, treatment side. Well, what is medical physics? Well, if you go to various websites, you'll get something along the lines of this. So it's an a, a applied branch of physics concerned with the application and the concepts and methods of physics to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. So there's already that sort of um, split, I guess, between diagnosis on one side and, and treatment on the other side. Essentially, you've got two career paths. If you were looking at this, if, you know, in terms of when you talk to your students, I guess, uh, you can either do a research-focused career path, or you can have one of these, uh, uh, or go for a clinical path. Um, generally, what you have to have is uh, an MSc or a PhD, so it's not typically what you would do as a career straight after your BSc. <coughs> there are, as a bit of an aside, you can do te what are called technician roles, which uh, are sort of a BSc appropriate, I guess. If you do want to work in the clinical setting, though, you have to undergo uh, training beyond this MSc, and that's called, um, in New Zealand, it's called TAP training anyway. And in, uh, essentially, having obtained your MSc or maybe your PhD, or maybe even at the same time, you actually go and work in a hospital for up to five years, actually. And it's termed either residency or something along those lines. And you actually get on-the-job training. At the end of which, you are now licensed or an accredited medical phys a clinical medical physicist. There is a current shortage in New Zealand, as well as in Australia and the rest of the world. So in terms of a career path, you're talking about careers, it certainly is a, uh, an area in which um, uh, there are, there are uh, a significant number of vacancies. And I always put that there because if you're ever talking to students, for example, or you're trying to convince people, it is actually, well, I'll forget that for a second, it's, it's, it's well paid. If you want to work in the North uh, America, for example, you're looking around 200000 a year easily, if not more. And it's rewarding in that you're applying science in a way which is directly benefiting people. You know, I'd be walking down the corridor and you can see the people that are actually benefiting from the input from the medical physicist. I've already broken it down into four little areas, I guess, so we'll just talk about the clinical for a start off. So in the, in the clinic you uh, get to deal with these things. Anyone know what that is? You could guess it's one of three things. You, could probably, you might say it's a CT, you might say it's a PET, or you might say it's an MRI. And I could tell you it's any of those three, any of those, and you probably believe me. But uh, this actually is a CT machine obviously used for imaging, uh, typically used for many things, but cancer diagnosis is one of the, the common things. From the medical physicist's perspective, you're talking at image quality. Uh, this, this does, as I said, it uses ionising radiation, but the dose is really low, so the chances of developing complications later due to the dose received from this is actually very low. It's a, it becomes a clinical decision as to whether the risk is worth it. But from the physicist's perspective, what you're looking at is things like, are things like image quality. The worst thing that could be happening, I guess, is that you've got a lesion which due to the fact that you can't actually diagnose or see differences in grayscale, for example, you can't actually see the lesions out of there. So the physicist is there to ensure your machine is working uh, appropriately. Uh, this is actually something you'd stick in an MRI phantom. MRI, uh, you may know about, it actually doesn't use ionising radiation, but again, it's about image quality. Uh, this is ultrasound, this is what you might look at. Again, not ionising radiation, but again, it sort of falls into the um, under the umbrella of uh, diagnostic medical physics. This is something called PET. So um, with PET, um, that's a nuclear medicine modality, again imaging, and you know, uh, radiation bad, right? If you ingest radiation, that's sort of like really bad, okay? <laughs> but in, in nuclear medicine, that's what they do to you, they actually make you, well, they either inject it to you, so it's needles as well, so it's triply bad maybe. But um, yeah, again, another way of determining um, extent of disease. 
from a diagnostic perspective. The other sort of branch within the clinical environment is treatment and radiation therapy is, um, if anyone uh, does require treatment for cancer, of, often you might get something like surgery or chemotherapy, there are, there are different things, but generally what you will find is that 50% of people get, also get radiation therapy. And this is one of the machines that they might use, it's called a Linac, that's a Varian Linac. If, uh, if there's some vendors here, I'll get some money for that maybe. But one of the, um, um, uh, again, one of the, the things that the, the, the medical physicist involved in is ensuring that what's coming out of here is what should be coming out of here. The doctor, the radiation oncologist says that so many gray of uh, radiation need to go to a certain point. Now how do you know that's actually what's, ca what's, what's actually happening unless you measure the output of this thing? And it's, it's something that requires people to be very precise, very accurate, a little bit um, uh, uh, obsessive, compulsive perhaps, because you've got to, you're ma making these really tiny measurements again and again to make sure it's right. If it's out by more than 2%, that, that machine's no good. Radiation therapy, if, you are, if you're out by 5%, either way, as in plus or minus 2.5%, you're either over, over -treat uh, under-treating the tumour, patient dies, or you're over-treating areas around the tumour, potentially patient dies or at least they get significant um, uh, complications. Radiation oncologist makes a mistake, patient dies. Medical physicist makes a mistake, all the patients for that month die. Effectively, okay? <laughs> or they're, they're mistreated. Okay, um, this is showing a, a kind of a treatment plan, so it's actually a prostate. So chances are this is actually a male patient and what you're actually seeing <laughs> is, uh, is, is beams of radiation going through here. Uh, as, as the radiation passes through tissue, it uh, is absorbed into the tissue, and as it's absorbed, it basically it's destroying cells. So you can see a beam going through in this direction here, slowly destroying cells. But how do you treat something at depth? Well, one way of doing it is you actually put multiple beams on, and, that, and so what you're getting is a hot spot in the middle at the, at the region of interest. The, this this shape's quite coarse. There are um, new modalities coming out which allow you to actually uh, make that really tight. It's all about treat the treatment planning as well. So how do you orient these beams so that to maximise uh, dose into the area you're trying to treat and minimise healthy, healthy tissue surrounding it. As far as, um, I guess one of the beauties of medical physics is if you're kind of into technical, uh, techni technical stuff, you get to play with all, all sorts of uh, gadgets and whiz-bangery, I suppose. You also have to be a little bit engineer, you have to ha actually understand how what was in here is going, uh, because it might be that it's a simple fix, which means physics does it, or it might be a complicated fix, in which case the engineer comes in, but the physicist has to know which area that's in. Okay, so that's sort of the clinical side of things, I suppose, the diagnostic and the uh, treatment side. From the research path, so um, I talked earlier about having to go into the um, clinical training environment in the hospital, which I, I've done. That's what you need to do if you want to work in a hospital. If you want to work in a university, you actually don't have to take that path. You might choose instead to go through a, re a research, um, take the research career path, which generally would involve, again, coming, probably doing a PhD, I suppose, and you get, then you can sort of work on quite cool projects. This is one we're working on with the University of Sydney, which is combining both an imaging and a treatment modality. So the idea here is that you've got some sort of a linac, so it's, it's actually firing out electrons or photons which interact with the tissue, destroying all tissue, but predominantly hopefully destroying uh, tumour tissue. But the problem with tumours is that they can move. It's okay if they're in, in your knee, <laughs> somewhere where, which doesn't move, but imagine the lungs. It's very, generally you want your patients to be breathing. If they're not breathing, you've got, you've got a bit of an issue. But the problem with tumours in the lung is that they, that they move. So you're breathing and now you, the tumour actually moves up and down. So uh, you know, how do you know where it is? And there are ways of looking at the, 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 the surface to try and guesstimate really where the tumour is. But another way is to, is to combine it with an MRI. So there's a project that we're working on in combination with uh, Sydney, looking at if you can, how do you put a, a, an electron gun in the, in the vicinity of an MRI. Now, the, what you may not know, they have a very, very large magnetic field associated with them, and you have some complications there. But if you could combine the two, which is the idea, you can actually see in real time where the tumour is moving and, and zap it where, it's, where it appropriately is. The good thing about this, of course, is it doesn't give you any dose. Another one that we're working on here is this thing called the Mars scanner. You may have heard about it, it's, got, it's had a bit of publicity lately. Uh, it's looking at sort of a multi, multi spectral uh, CT, one, one way of thinking about it, it's, or colour CT. This is, a, this is the, the box, it's, it's obviously in development. Once by the time it goes commercial, it looks much fancier than that. You, know, you can't demand millions and millions of th dollars for something that looks like a steel box. But here's, a, um, here's an image, one of the first images that came out of it, I suppose. That's, of a, that's actually of a mouse. And so some of the structure is very, very fine. And, and 
to look at that, you might go, that's great, it's a bit coarse maybe, but the beauty of it <laughs> is you're actually looking at three different things at the same time. And the thing about that is that until that was done, it was said it was impossible, so that's, that's quite cool. So that's sort of two things that we're working on here. So just to kind of conclude, first of all, in terms of getting interest, I suppose, from students getting into it, there is actually a career at the end of it, there is a job. There's a shortage in the world. New Zealand is, is always understaffed. Uh, we tend to be recruiting from overseas in order to fill it. It's interesting and fulfilling career choice, so you, you do get, you know, at the end of the day, you do feel like you've made a difference to the world. You certainly made a difference to some people's worlds and that they still have them. If you want to um, get into it, I suppose, uh, physics is a, an essential thing. Uh, mathematics is an essential thing. Um, biology I put there as well. It's not really the, the, but if you do understand a bit of the biology, it makes it perhaps a little bit easier. Uh, so essential but not recommended. And I'm findable on the, on the web anyway, so if you want to talk to me about anything else, just send me an email, I'm happy to talk to you. Thank <laughs> you.